You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Bryce, welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast. I'm very excited for today's episode. I'd like to start off by thanking Han Hai for allowing us to record and use their facilities for today's episode. But with that, Bryce, do you have a disclaimer or anything that you'd just like to, to say right now, just kind of give an umbrella to this whole episode? Sure, yeah. Thanks for having me in, by the way. Great to be here. Um, so I just offer that um, during this podcast, the purpose is for education, right? For shareholders in general in the marketplace. I'm not giving opinions uh, nor recommendations for any solution, any solution provider. There's a lot of solutions, a lot of solution providers out there. People need to do their own homework. They need to run their you know, numbers by their accountant, legal docs by their lawyers, what have you. Um, I'm here to give a general overview of of what the marketplace looks like and what my experience of that has been thus far personally. Fantastic. And we're going to have a disclaimer in the show notes. So please, everyone, check that out uh, as a reference. But, you know, with that, let's just go right in the episode. So, Bryce, can you give us a little bit of your background, your career up until this point? And also, I'm curious, how have you been able to pick all these winners that you're probably about to mention that you've worked for? Um, so. You know, luck it, it is, is, the, is the first part of the answer, right? Um, you know, I, I got fortunate originally to work with some really fantastic people uh, through a friendship that I had from college. And from there, as I started to meet people in the industry, um, I formed a lot of friendships. And as I formed those friendships, uh, when I'd be leaving a company, I would oftentimes go on as an advisor to other companies, whether it was um, 4C uh, uh, basis or other companies like that. And so um, as I started to work with these people as an advisor, I'd get the opportunity to get into the company and see if there was a product market fit opportunity. Uh, what I'd oftentimes look for, and this is what I recommend to anyone as they're looking for their next opportunity is if you're in sales, find a company that has a lot of engineers. <laughs> and if you're an engineer, find a company that has a lot of salespeople um, because it gives you the opportunity to have a great role within that company and hopefully build a great, uh, a great product and service. I think with that one little bit of information, I think we can close the episode. I mean, that, <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing information. Can you tell our audience a little bit, kind of some of the names of the companies you've worked sure. with? And then also, let's just lead that into right now, the current company that you've, that you're, that you founded. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, Got my start as a head of, of revenue and a head of sales um, at a company called MySpace back in the day. We, you know, I think that, was, that company probably played some role in pop culture for, for anyone that might be listening to, to this podcast or, or watching it. Um, and, and then from there, I went on to run sales at a company called 4C, which sold about a year and a half ago, and another company called Basis, which just filed to go public at the beginning of this year. Um, and all of those companies almost, I, I started working with them because I found friends there, right? I was friends with the founders and, and got to know them, love the companies, the visions, the people, the culture, what have you. Um, and so as I was working my way through my career, as I would leave a private company, oftentimes I needed to buy options and pay tax. And so I came to the secondary markets, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, to start to, to to try to find financiers who could help me afford these pretty hefty option exercise bills and tax bills. And uh, I became intrigued by it. Uh, one, two, as I would bring people onto my teams, I'd oftentimes informally educate them on equity and how it worked, right? There's just a huge opportunity for education in this space in general, and I did it informally then. And so that's what brought me to this space, the finance side of um, of private companies in the secondary market three years ago, running sales at um, a company called Quid, which is one of the larger kind of uh, you know lenders in the space, limited recourse lenders. Um, and over the course of those past three years, I spoke with called a thousand shareholders a year, co-founders, companies, um, heads of finance, heads of sales, engineers, early engineers, what have you, investors. And I truly enjoyed my conversations with them, helping them sort out uh, really the liquidity landscape and, and think through what liquidity meant to them and what the various solutions were. Um, and so I wanted to um, be able to form a company, which I have called Sidecar, which launched a few months ago, which is an advisory service for 
um, private shareholders to help them figure out liquidity, you know, full stop. So if they're looking for liquidity to exercise options, pay tax, buy a house, start a business, what have you, we'll look at the various solutions across limited recourse transactions, which are advances, uh, recourse transactions, and sale transactions, and figure out what solution matches their needs uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and then once we figure out what solution is, you know, feels right to them, we'll go speak to different providers in the marketplace and, and find a partner that they like. Okay. So there's a lot of terminology used right there. And, you know, you mentioned the various solutions. Can you go a little bit deeper into all these, ver all these solutions and really tell us kind of maybe the positives and negatives of each, but I mean, really more than anything, just educate us. Yeah, I would have, I'd be happy to. So, um, you know, there's three kind of buckets, which I just talked about. There's sale transactions. Let's just say that sale transactions in the private market on private shares represent 80% of the deals that are done in the secondary market. Then there's recourse transactions, which are somebody provides you a million dollars. You've got to pay back the million dollars no matter what happens, um, as well as interest. And then there's limited recourse um, advances where these companies basically say, okay, we're going to give you a million dollars, if, but the you know, advance that we're giving you is only backed by the value of your shares. If the value of your shares ends up becoming less than that, let's say it's worth 100,000, then you either transfer your shares, they've collateralized this transaction, or you transfer us $100,000. And I can go into greater detail on, on each of those if you like. Actually, uh, I would. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> So why don't we start with sale transactions, right? That's, you know, as I said, that's about 80% of the transactions that are done. There's three types of sale transactions that generally happen. The first is tender offers. So the company, this will usually accompany uh, a round of financing that's just happened, right? Uh, where the company's raised capital and the investors who came on board might say, okay, here's a hundred million dollars to grow the company. Here's another 50 million. You can use this to, um, you know, to help the shareholders get some liquidity. Right. These are pretty popular. Um, some of the positive elements of these transactions are one, they're blessed by the company. The company knows about them. They're run by the company. Oftentimes they might be run even programmatically through a, so, through a software solution. NASDAQ private markets, Carta, a bunch of other groups play in that space and the company decides who that's going to be. Um, so, you know, company approves it, company's aware of it. Um, usually the price is somewhere, it can be, you know, lower than the last round, uh, discounted, what have you. Um, but it's usually a somewhat of a reasonable price at that, you know, at that moment in time. Um, this one of the negatives is generally the company is going to limit how many shares you can sell. It might be 10%, might be 20%, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, if you're a past employee, you might not be able to participate in those tenders. Um, uh, sometimes they're only for existing employees. So that's company tenders. And then you've got, um, and then you've got, there's a direct transfer of the shares. So people know about this from the, the, the terminology, a row for right of first refusal. This means a seller goes out, they, you know, a shareholder, they find a buyer or a broker finds a buyer for them. Generally, most people don't find their own buyer. Um, and then they go to the company and say, great, I've found XYZ fund who wants to buy my shares company. Will you please allow it? And the company says, give me 30 days. Let me see if we want to at that price, what have you. After the 30 days, if they don't want to do it, and it might be 30 days, it might be 60 days, what have you, every company is a little bit different. The company says, go ahead and do the transaction. And we're happy to change the name on the cap table from your name to this new company's name. So that's kind of how it works. Um, so, you know, some of the positives are you might be able to sell a lot more than 10 to 25% of your shares. Maybe you can liquidate all of it. Um, the company's aware of it. Um, there is that right of first refusal. So it takes a little bit longer. Sometimes you might end up having a different counterparty, which is the company, which isn't a bad outcome. Um, and then the third solution, which is, I'd say very bespoke, maybe it happens 10% of the time are called forward contracts. This is where, you know, same seller goes out through a broker, would have you, finds a buyer, and they come to an agreement which says, today, I'm going to give you the million dollars that I'm paying you for your shares. At a future point in time, you will send me back the shares. 
so I can liquidate them, hold them, whatever I want to do. These are oftentimes um, a solution that a shareholder might seek if the company doesn't want to do a direct transfer for one or a number of reasons. Shareholders should always check their shareholder restrictions, their options agreement, um, their, uh, their stock certificates, what have you, their stock docs to make sure that this is allowed for them. Uh, generally, those forward contracts might be at a discount um, because that buyer is taking on counterparty risk. There's a risk that at a future point in time, the seller might say, you know, I'm not going to deliver your share, the shares to you. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't allowed to do this transaction. I shouldn't have done it. Or if God forbid that shareholder passes away, their estate may say, you know, John Doe never told us about this transaction. We didn't know they were getting into it. And so in that case, um, there's counterparty risk. So that's kind of sale transactions. Uh, and I'll pause there for any questions, and then I can maybe talk about recourse and non-recourse transactions. For those transactions, the, the processes, are these quick or, or, or how long does these get drawn out for? What's the time, yeah. an average time frame? Great question. So with a company tender, usually those will take the company a few months to orchestrate. And then there's a window of time that those offers are open for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, what have you. Um, where that shareholder has a choice to make a decision, right? Uh, so relatively short, um, a uh, direct transfer, there's going to be, you know, maybe a month, you know, a couple of weeks to a month to find a buyer. Um, and then that row for a period of time. So right of first refusal, 30 days, 60 days, what have you, and then some legal docs for a few more weeks. Um, so call it, I'd say one to four months there. And a lot of times there's delays in these transactions for no good reason other than these counterparties take time um, to, to get through docs. Um, and sometimes the counterparty that's buying these shares, if it's a direct transfer or if it's a Ford, um, they are going and getting money from yet another investor. So there's a, there's a prolonged timeline on some of these transactions. Uh, and then a Ford contract, if the investor already has money, the buyer that is, and they want to do the transaction, sometimes I've seen those happen in a week. They can happen really fast. Um, but again, you know, the deal might become, might be agreed to in a week and then you might come into a month or two of funding delays for any number of reasons. Maybe there's U.S. investors, maybe there's foreign investors. And so as a seller, um, I would just manage your expectations on timing and stay patient and don't drive yourself, uh, you know, don't create more stress than you should for yourself. Just know it's going to take longer than you expect. That's interesting that these times could be vary so much from a month to four months. In that time, if say the company's in the news or, or there's hiccups, does one party ever go back to the other party and go, hey, you know what, I kind of want to adjust my offer? Or once it's on day one start, it's like, hey, sorry, it's kind of, we already kind of agreed on this. So once, once you sign a document, right, it's very hard to you know, it's hard to go back and change the price. But as you can imagine, there's a period of time where these documents are being reviewed by lawyers. Um, maybe the buyer or the seller are sitting on the documents a bit, contemplating. And as there's news, um, it is not uncommon for these buyers and sellers to say, oh, I want a little bit more. Or I want to pay a little bit less. And so um, that can happen. Clearly, right now, we're living in some unprecedented markets where, um, you know, I just say up until, call it, you know, January, February of uh, 2022, um, there were a lot of sellers out there. There were a lot of buyers out there. Now there's fewer buyers. There's a lot more sellers. So um, in turbulent markets like this, I think people take longer to do these transactions because there's not that sense of urgency that I'm going to miss out on, on buying or selling. Now, I definitely want you to continue the, the answer from before, but I just had one other quick question. Yeah. In this process, if you're thinking of doing one, should you have your lawyer and everyone lined up on your team way in advance? Or is it one of those things where it's, okay, the investment banker has gone out and found the buyer. Now I can get my lawyer on the team. Like how, how prepared should you be in this process with your team that you're going to be used, that you're using? Right. So when you, when you get to a point as a seller, the buyers are always going to have lawyers and accountants that they're working with. Many of these folks are 
sophisticated financial institutions or they spend their time in finance because they're writing very large checks oftentimes. As a seller, when you get to the point that you're serious about this transaction, maybe you've heard about a couple of buyers, um, it's a good idea to start to find that accountant or lawyer. Maybe sit down with a couple of them and see who do I jive with? Who do I feel like has the right background and has done transactions like this? So they understand the idiosyncrasies and the unique elements of each of these solutions and these documents. It's tough to take someone off the street who hasn't done transactions in the secondary space and say, okay, great. So we've got, a t- we've got about a 24 hour turnaround. If you can just knowledge up on, you know, 10 years of secondary market contracts law, that would be amazing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, you know, a pressure cooker time-wise. So I would say depending on the um, level of knowledge of the team that you're working with, if they're less informed, start early. If they're more informed, you may have more flexibility in terms of timing. Great advice. Tell us, okay, go back to the yes. question before. So we hit sale transactions and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on these throughout the conversation. But so that's, you know, liquidity channel number one, I want to sell shares. Liquidity channel number two is I want to take out a limited, or I'm sorry, a a recourse loan. What does a recourse loan mean? Um, Just take the word recourse out and it kind of feels like how we think about loans. Somebody loans you money, you've got to pay them back and you've got to pay interest uh, or some sort of fees. And so um, I would say this is a small group of people who take out recourse loans and they're taking these funds out to either, again, uh, buy shares pay taxes or gain liquidity to buy something or have diversification. For a recourse loan, um, there's, you're, you're not going to be able to generally take out a recourse loan back only by the value of your shares. These lenders are going to want to know that you have some other investments, you have a house, you have personal assets that, might, that will help you fulfill your obligation to them if you end up, if the stock ends up going to zero, right? And so this is generally reserved for people who have already had success. They've had an exit or something. It's generally going to be the, um, you know, a a cheaper cost of capital than a limited recourse transaction where you're not taking in as on as much risk theoretically. Um, So you're saying uh, less capital as in the interest rates would be a lot less. That's right. Yeah. So the interest rates on a recourse loan should generally be lower. And there's a few ways that you can do these. You might go to a traditional bank and say, great, provide me a loan. This is, this is my balance sheet, right? The second is if you have publicly traded you know, stock, many of those banks will end up being, uh, will be willing to do what's called a margin loan um, or an asset back loan against those shares. Now, the risk there is if the stock goes down significantly, that bank might say, hey, you you got to start paying us back because there's too much risk in these stocks or in the market, what have you, or you as a counterparty. Um, And then the third kind of transaction is, or I should say on the recourse side, senior level executives at multi-billion dollar companies are highly coveted counterparties, right? Big banks want to work with these people. They want to be able to take them public. They want to be able to give them lines of credit. They want to be able to be a capital provider to them. And so in exchange, they say, look, if you ever need personal funds against your $100 million position, we'll advance you money. No big deal. And we'll do it at reasonable rates. They use it as a, you know, kind of a carrot to win the business. Generally, the people that are fit for that are senior level executives, um, very senior, C-level, um, founders of, of companies, what have you. So those are recourse transactions. I'm happy to, to speak about those more. Any questions? It's, it's all about just keep diving deeper. Yeah, that, I love that, it. That's the key. Okay. So, and then I'd say the last category, um, you know, the last channel that's really popular, and then I can mention a bespoke solution, but is limited recourse transactions. So limited recourse means we provide you a million dollars, stock goes to a hundred thousand, pay us a hundred thousand instead of the million back, right? And there is probably seven different companies that are doing this now. You know, this vertical has been around for eight, nine, 10 years. Um, and there's more competition now, which is great, generally speaking, for prices because shareholders and, and sellers uh, should get a better deal. But I'm guessing with 
with that, they'd probably be very selective of which companies they would actually give the loans for those shares versus maybe the other one you have a more broader um, appeal. Yeah, yeah, a bigger market. Right. Uh, great point. And absolutely. So um, across these, you know, seven or eight different limited recourse advanced providers, loan providers, advanced and loan are kind of used synonymously in that industry, in that category. Um, they need data on the company to underwrite the risk because they realize that, you know, if it's a WeWork or something, stock goes down significantly, then they've got a lot of risk on their hands. Well, I, I guess question on that one. These are all private companies. So right. how much information do these potential lenders, how much information do they have that's maybe just not what you hear about in newspapers and magazines and, and that? So what we've seen in the last few years is companies are increasingly willing to partner with these limited recourse advanced providers because if you think about the um, the kind of spirit of these agreements, the shareholders basically saying, look, I need liquidity. I don't want to sell because I'm so bullish on this opportunity. I want to hold on to as much of the upside as possible. Now, those limited recourse providers will take a portion of the upside, but the shareholder gets to keep a lot of it. And so companies like that, they want bullish employees. They want employees who aren't trying to um, liquidate or de-risk. They want employees that that um, and shareholders who want to make the company extremely valuable. It aligns the vision and mission of, of the company. And so um, what we're finding is more and more companies are willing to share data under NDA with these types of providers and run even you know, company-wide programs in order to, to provide shareholders with funds to exercise options or you know, gain liquidity. And, and I also am curious, these companies that these loan providers are even considering, I mean, we're not talking about a Series A company, right? No. Where where are they in kind of that life cycle? Well, it, you know, the ecosystem, I would say there are the majority of those, you know, seven, eight players, they focus on companies that are worth over $500 million in market cap, right? They're doing $50 million more in revenue. They're growing by 50% or more. They've got a two to three year horizon on a liquidity event, though that might be a little bit elongated now with the recent downturn in the economy, um, or I should say the stock market at least, the window closing a bit for the time being. Um, but yeah, they're looking for hyper growth companies. They're looking for companies that have high margins that don't have really heavy cap tables, right? Pref stacks where in a worst case scenario, or even in a marginal case, the preferred shareholders get all the gains of the company and the common folks get very little because generally they're working with common shareholders. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's about right. Yeah. Let's go back to sure. the, that question. Yeah. Okay. Dive deeper. I, on which types of companies? See, uh, oh, well, actually, and I should have mentioned this. So most of the companies focused on $500 million or more. Um, there's a couple of fantastic, um, you know, groups who, uh, who focus on earlier stage companies too, where they're willing to take on more risk. They're going to charge more fees, generally speaking, in order to do so, but they're willing to uh, provide advances to companies that are worth 100 million, 200 million that they think are good companies in good categories, um, and even some earlier than $100 million. And I think that as this ecosystem continues to grow, Right, the secondary ecosystem um, is still relatively young when you think of all the pent up uh, market opportunity and, and just capital sitting on the balance sheets of these companies in terms of, of stock. Um, you're going to see the ecosystem uh, become much larger. You're going to see more companies be willing to take risk on earlier stage companies and provide advances and do it through secondary opportunities, whether that's buying shares. Or, or, or providing advances. Um, you know, if you looked at this space five years ago, maybe there were three limited recourse providers. And now there's, you know, call it eight. So the ecosystem's expanding, you know, that, that's what 200% growth in five years. And if we do it again, it'll be a, a 20 person, 20 company ecosystem. Yeah, doubling. Okay. Right. 
Okay, let's go go back, go back now. It was um we were talking about direct transactions or transactions. Dive a little bit deeper in oh, I guess that that whole setup that I mean you hear of SPVs, you hear of all this stuff, but right. what are those? Sure. So on uh, sale transactions is what I think we're we're getting at here. So on sale transactions, we talked about company tenders. That's pretty plain vanilla ish, right? Um, you know, direct transfers. I think your your questions about counterparties. Who is the counterparty? Who's buying these shares that I'm selling? Either that I'm directly transferring on the company's cap table, or that I am um, selling to a sh- to a buyer through a forward structure. So the groups that are active in this market are hedge funds, right? They like risk. They like um, data asymmetry. They like markets that are more bespoke, that are that are newer, where there's hyper growth. There's family offices, right? So they might be mission driven. They might be category driven. They can make their own decisions. They do their own diligence. They like to spread across private markets and public markets, et cetera. And then um, And then there are, you mentioned SPVs, so special purpose vehicles, which is essentially some investors get together and say, great, we have a seller who wants to sell $10 million of a very popular company. And I don't have $10 million, but I know 10 financial institutions who each have a million dollars. And I'm going to pull them together and we'll have 10 million. And as a, uh, you know, as a reward for me pulling these people together and setting them up with the seller, I will take a fee on that. So some SPV, special purpose vehicles, charge 0% management fee, which means they don't get an annual fee. Um, Some charge a 2% annual fee. And then many of them also charge some sort of fee on the back end where they get participation in the upside of the investment. So some of those SPVs, do they... Maybe have that kind of that more traditional fund structure, that two and 2 percent fees, twenty percent carry. Is that kind yeah. of what people are seeing in in these SPVs? It, it ranges, right, based on the popularity of the name, uh, popularity of the company, and how much demand there is to get access. But it can be two and twenty. It can be one and ten. It can be zero and five. Uh, you you see it all over the place. The role that the um that the SPV plays in this ecosystem is it's allowing investors who can write smaller checks to find, to get access to, um, to categories of companies they'd never be able to, they generally wouldn't be able to access on their own. You know, if I'm a seller, let's say I'm the CRO of a, of a company that's worth, you know, $10 billion and I've got $50 million worth of shares. If I want to sell $10 million worth of shares, I don't want to go do 10 different transactions. I'd like to have one counterparty. And to the same point, the company would like to have as few people, generally speaking, on the cap table as possible. So if I can find, you know, put one person on a cap table that I'm sending investment updates to, what have you, it's much easier on me than having 10. Now, are there any risk or anything that people should be aware of with these SPVs or anything that's not? I guess I want to say higher risk than you know what we'd mentioned before with Ford transactions right. or 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 that. So um, I'm probably not the best person to speak about all of the risks with SPVs. You know, probably a lawyer would be the best person to assuage on that topic. And this is not legal advice. And this is not legal advice. Uh, but you know what what I've encountered is the one of the risks to the shareholder is just time, right? So. You know, that SPV might say, yep, we've got the $10 million, but they've really only soft circled three and they've got ideas for another seven, you know, $7 million worth of investors. And so that might elongate the cycle and it might exacerbate the situation. And that might be a situation where the SPV owner or manager comes back and says, I told you 10, it's going to be five. Right. And so I think that's one of the, the pain points that a shareholder may encounter and uh, and there will be certainly other you know legal risks with that too. Are there other hiccups that people see when trying to sell their shares? Maybe 
a lot of play, a lot of middlemen in these transactions yes. or, or anything that you're seeing. And before we go in, because I really want to also ask you about 409A evaluations, all this other sure. stuff. Yeah. So um, I think your question was, uh, repeat that if you would. Oh, risk. when people trying to sell their, their shares, issues with middlemen, where right. all these bankers get involved or, yeah. you know, cousins and uncles of whoever. Right, right. So the, there certainly is risk and, and pain points more than anything, right? So um, as I said, most of the times a seller is not going to find their own buyer. They're probably a shareholder. They're an employee. They've got an, you know, they're working 80 hours a, a week at a hyper growth company. They don't have the time. And so they might find a person who's reached out to them on LinkedIn or a friend has worked with this broker who helps them find a seller. So the goal should always be to be as direct as possible to the buyer if you're a seller. That might mean you're working with a broker that represents you and you're working and that broker is working with a broker that represents the buyer. That's not terrible. That's probably pretty standard. There are groups and they play a really important role, which are called intermediary brokers, which sit between the seller's broker and the buyer's broker. And they usually have access and purview to the to very large markets. And so they can be very helpful um, in times where uh, it's harder to find buyers. Um, but Every person you introduce to these conversations just elongates the communication cycle and makes it more complicated. Yeah, I used to play that game telephone growing up. Yeah, <laughs> it's it is. We played it the other night at at at, uh, at dinner with some friends, and our little girls came up with some pretty good, uh, you know, conjugations on word words and what have you. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Now let's go 409A valuations first. What is that? Yes. What should employees, founders, what should people know about that? So there's a few, um, there's, there's kind of two prices that, are, that a shareholder might be able to get their hands on. The first is called a 409A valuation. What that is, is every quarter, every half a year, every year on some cadence, and the cadence becomes more frequent as the company gets closer to going public. The finance team sits down and says, okay, they work with a third party and they say, what's this company worth? What are we going to tell the government the price of these shares is worth? And by the way, that's also the price we're going to use for new shareholders who are getting grants, new grants. So the 409A valuation of the company is what that price is. The next price that shareholders care about is the preferred price, which is what's the price that the last group of investors paid for every share they bought when they invested in the company. Usually there's a disconnect between the 409A price and the preferred price. For earlier companies, the 409A price might be 20% of the preferred. For later stage companies, it might be 80 or 90% of the preferred. And when those companies go public, that 409A and the preferred price become the same. And so, this is important for shareholders who want to exercise their options because when they exercise their options, they're going to take the number of shares they want to exercise. They're going to multiply that by the difference between the 409A and the strike price of their options whenever they got granted those. And then they're going to pay applicable taxes based on those rates. And it might be one rate if they're ISOs, incentivized stock options. It might be another rate if they're NSOs, non-qualified stock options. In fact, it is different rates um, and check with your accountant on those. But generally speaking, um, you know, ISOs are going to be taxed using a concept called alternative minimum tax and NSOs are generally going to be taxed on that delta at ordinary income tax rates. Um, so that's why that relationship of the 409A and the preferred rate becomes really important for shareholders who are trying to exercise their options. Now, if I wanted to exercise my options, what are the the cost in doing that? And maybe what should I ask myself on a financial basis before even going out to try to exercise them? Sure. So the two costs when you're exercising your options um, are one, you've got to pay the exercise cost. So let's say the company said, here's a thousand shares and they're at a dollar strike price. That's what the 409A evaluation of the company was, was dollar per share when you joined the company. 
So in that case, they've got to pay $1,000 just to exercise. Um, and then they're going to pay the difference between the 409A and that dollar um, strike price, right? So let's say the 409A today is $4. So the person's going to have a gain of $4 minus $1, so $3. So they're going to pay three, you know, they're going to pay tax on $3,000 of gains at that, either at that moment in time or at some point in the future. And so those are the types of calculations that are important to work with an accountant on or a, a group who's done this before. Um, so that's the cost of, of exercising. As a shareholder, what I like to recommend to people is if you, if your company has a preferred price that is two and a half times the 409A or stated easier, maybe if the 409A is 40% of the preferred or less, right? So 409A is at $10. If the, if the, um, or if the preferred's at $10, if the 409A is less than $4, you should think about exercising your options. You should see if it's a good idea proactively. Um, that comes down to how much risk you want to take on. Anytime you're exercising options, you're basically saying, I'm going to pay cash now. And if the company goes to zero, I don't get a lot of this. You know, there might be you know, ways to get some of the tax back in the future, but the exercise, exercise cost, I'm not going to see that again. Um, and so there's risks when you exercise uh, that, that every shareholder should take into account. The other option is, or the other time this often comes up, is if a person's leaving a company, they have to make that decision. Generally, there are clocks, periods of time that the shareholder has to exercise these options. Industry standard has traditionally been 90 days. If I leave a company, my clock starts. 90 days from now, I either have to say I'm going to exercise them or I'm not. And so at that point in time, the shareholder needs to sit down with their accountant, their family, their, you know, whoever they're working with, who's got vested interest in this and make a decision on, do we think this is a good investment and we should do it or not? Um, so that often comes up. So these shares that in any of these transactions that were mentioned before, have they already been vested? Have they not been vested? Are they options kind of? I mean, those, those terms get thrown around a lot. Right. And actually, I guess for our audience, what is vested versus non-vested shares first before, before I answer? I love it. Let's keep it simple because a lot of people might not know that. And as you get into the explanation, it'll, they'll be lost. So a vested share, when, when I start, I'll even go back to granted shares. So I started a company, I'm granted shares. Let's say the company says you get 10,000 shares, Bryce. And so what happens there is there's a vesting schedule that's set up. For most companies, it's a four-year vesting schedule with a one-year cliff. What does that mean? That means that first year, I, d I haven't vested any of my shares. But on that, uh, on that first day of the second year, now I've vested a quarter of those. So 2,500 of those 10,000 shares are now vested. And then going forward every month, I'm going to vest 136th of the remaining amount of shares that I have. And so that's how vesting works. Now, some companies will allow shareholders at the time they join the company to buy their unvested shares. They might say, hey, Bryce, you can buy all 10,000 shares today on day one. And if you leave the company, we'll pay you back um, you know, the amount of money you paid pro rata, right, for whatever is unvested when you leave. And so many, some more companies are starting to do that. The reason why shareholders like to do that is on that day they start, as, your, as a reminder, the 409A price and the strike price is generally the same. So there's not going to necessarily be a tax that that person has to pay at that moment in time. So that's why shareholders and employees like to do that. Um, so uh, so what you're seeing is a trend towards, towards people wanting to early exercise is what that's called. And you can usually early exercise at any point. In time, you might get two years and say, in and say, you know what, the 409A is a good place. I'm going to early exercise. Not every company will allow you to do that, um, but more and more companies are. Also, earlier you'd mentioned ROFR, right of first refusal. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that or any other possible restrictions there might be in an employee just basically 
doing anything he wants with yeah. with vested shares. Sure. So um, right of first refusal is you've got to run it by the company. They get the chance to buy the shares before an investor. Transfer restrictions is one of the terms, and it's just one of the terms you want to look out for in legal documents. I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't legal advice. Check a lawyer. Uh, but you know, transfer restrictions is, is one of the key terms that you're going to hear thrown out a lot in the industry. Do you have the ability to transfer your shares or not? Just because I was granted those 10,000 options, let's say I was there for two years, so I've now earned 5,000 options, I bought them. Theoretically, I, have, I do have 5,000 shares, but the company doesn't say, okay, now go sell them to whoever you like. They say, no, if you want to sell them, you got to go through this process called a row for period, what have you, where we get the chance to buy those. And the company generally does that so that they can control who the investors are. Who are they answering to? Who's participating in the growth or decline of the company, et cetera? Interesting. And, and with this, say, you know, everything is good. You're allowed to share, sell your shares. Is selling your shares in the secondary market, does it impact the company's valuation at all? Great question. So there, there can be a risk to the company. And this is one of the reasons why companies oftentimes want to be involved in that secondary sale process um, and control it to a certain degree. Because theoretically, if let's say that I, the company just raised money and the price of the shares was $10, okay? And I go and I sell shares at $13. Well, all of that work that the finance team just did to revalue the company based on preferred investors coming in at $10, let's say they said the 409A was $3, but now it's going to be $5 because the company is more valuable. If I go sell shares at $13 in the secondary market, it can cause some headaches for the finance team where they say, wait, should we now be re-evaluating the 409A valuation of the company? And it shouldn't be $5 now, it should be $7, which can create headaches for the CFO the uh, you know, chief legal counsel, the CEO, investors, what have you. And so that's really one of the risks that the company sees when they think about secondaries. And it's one of the reasons why for a long time, secondaries was a bit of a dirty word around the industry. Now you're seeing that in order to recruit the best talent in the Valley and globally, right? Um, in the Valley, the alley and the beach, right? And, and globally, of course, um, that Companies have to lay out for new employees. This is our path to help you become liquid on these shares or options that we're granting you. This isn't phantom money. It's, it's, you can actually monetize these at some point in time, whether that's laying out for the shareholder that there will be tender events or we're open to secondary transactions or you can take advances if you like. And so it really has become... Uh, you know, one, a recruiting tool, and two, there are C-level executives out there that might be taking out liquidity who feel, hey, is it really right for me to be able to do this and not my other shareholders? Um, so you see a lot of, you know, great actors and, and good people that are C-level executives who are saying, I need to do something for my employees too. So we feel like there's equity in our company. So for these employees, for you know, the people on the team that are saying, you know, it's time. I want to take some chips off the table. Right. You know, maybe they come to you and, and they're like, hey, I'm confused about the process. What, from my understanding, you have something called a liquidity model. For, yeah. For, for, I, don't, I have no idea. God, right. Can you tell us what that is sure. in detail? Sure. So adult learning theory, right? We learn best through example. So to talk in generalities about concepts is great, but we tune out. There's too many other real things in our life that need our attention. And so what I do is um, I walk shareholders through what I call a liquidity model. It's a spreadsheet. And we retrofit it on the fly during our first half hour call and pull in their, um, the different equity types that they have. Do they have ISOs, NSOs that they're trying to exercise? Do they have RSUs? Do they have shares that they own? What are they trying to achieve? And we build out this liquidity model that says, okay, you've got 10,000 shares. You want X amount of money. Let's say you want, you know, hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, we'll look and say, this is what your world looks like with a limited recourse advance. 
this is what your world looks like with a recourse advance, a, a typical loan. And this is what it looks like if you go sell shares. And this is what it looks like if you've got options, you're thinking about exercising them and you choose not to exercise them. The company goes public. You do what's called castless exercise, which I can get to in, to in a moment. And um, your ISOs convert essentially, uh, you know, you, 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 you do castless exercise. I'll talk about it in a moment. So we build this model for people and we say, here's where it feels like you're going to do um, the best economically, right? These are just the numbers of it. If we assume all these assumptions, we let shareholders play with these assumption models. What price do you think the company is going to you know, liquidate at eventually? How long do you think that is? And we, we use kind of some, some standard fees. And then once we go through that process, generally the shareholder says, okay, wow, I've learned a lot. Feels like recourse is off the table. I don't have the balance sheet for it. Limited recourse is really interesting, but I can't get access to data. And I do want to really truly diversify. So I'm going to take out, I'm going to go sell shares. Let me go look at the market and find them buyers, right? Um, some people say, look, I don't want to sell. I'm just too bullish. I can't do a recourse loan. Let's do limited recourse loans. And we'll go out to the market and talk to eight different providers and say, great, this is the terms that these are the three companies that are willing to um, underwrite the company. These are the rough terms. Let's, let's get into it. And then we'll, we'll help them, you know, find a deal that they, that they're happy with. They like. You mentioned cash. Cashless exercise. Yes. So cashless exercise. What is that? That's I've got options and I need to pay money to exercise them and pay tax. And so the company says, okay, great. You've got 10,000 options. Um, it's going to cost you a bunch of money to exercise these and pay the tax. Give us 4,000 shares, just as an example. We'll, you, we'll, we'll take the value of those and pay your tax bill and pay your exercise bill, and then you keep the other six. Now, what happens is I'm actually exercising and selling within that moment of time, which means now I'm paying ordinary income tax on those. So there can be some tax consequences of that that shareholders might not want. You know, shareholders in a perfect world, if they like the company, oftentimes they want to be able to exercise options and hold them for a long period of time so that they can hopefully get better tax status. Um, and so that's the comparison that people are doing is, look, do I just wait to exercise later or is there truly an advantage to exercising early and trying to get capital gains if I can hold up? Okay. Let's walk through a potential scenario. Sure. Okay, working at a company, been there as a, one of the top 50 employees. Company is now worth, we'll say, six, seven hundred million, last valuation. Wife, wife and I want to have our first kid. We're living in a studio in San Francisco. Every time we go outside the front door, someone's dropping needles in front of us. We go, oh my gosh, <laughs> maybe we should get a house with a backyard someplace outside the city come to you and go, listen, I'm sitting on, you know, all these vested shares. You right. know, I was one of the early employees. I've been there six, seven years now. The company's doing great. What would the conversation look like? Yeah. So the first question is, are you sitting on options or are you sitting on shares, right? If you're sitting on options, um, I can go find providers who can help give you, who can provide you the funds, hopefully to buy those options. And depending on that, differential between the 409A and the preferred and how much risk these capital providers are willing to take, they might be able to give you additional funds as well to buy that house or put down a mortgage rather, right? If you're a shareholder, you've already exercised your options, then you can go to either, you know, we'll say, look, there are, there are limited recourse um, providers, loan providers, advanced providers who will give you 30 cents for every dollar you own today. And you get to hold on to a lot of your shares or the market's really hot or the, or these are buyers, right? Might be at a discount, might be at a premium. This is um, the price that buyers are willing to, re to, to pay in order to buy your shares. And so there's a couple of things we're solving for there. One, how much money do you need? Can we achieve it through a limited recourse? Is it possible or is it only possible through a sale? Two, what are the prices of these different solutions to figure out based on where you think the company's going, how long it is to exit, 
what the sale price or the IPO price will eventually be. Um, where do you preserve the most money? Where do you preserve less money? Okay, another scenario. I've been at the company two years, but I'm tired of it. I just want to leave. I'm done with it. You know, a couple of my, my shares have vested, but not much. Do I have any options here? So, you know, the minimum transaction for any of these companies is going to be fifty or hundred thousand dollars. There are a couple of places actually that will do large smaller transactions, ten thousand. Um, and so there are options. It will depend on the strength of the company. If it's at a, you know, a well-regarded multi-billion dollar company, you should be able to find a group that will be able to um, provide you the funds to exercise. Or you might find some people that are willing to uh, buy some of your shares at a discount enough so they can exercise and then keep some of your shares. So I'd always encourage, uh, you know, people take these roles, they work really hard for these companies, they provide value to them, God willing. And it's easy when you leave a company to be frustrated, to be exhausted, to be like, ah, the company's not going anywhere anyway. But if that company does grow into being a very successful company, you're going to kick yourself for not spending the hour or two Googling around or speaking with me or talking to someone in the industry to find out, do I have optionality? Is it going to cost me money or not? Because you might be able to find a capital provider that's willing to share the risk with you on these transactions and help you exercise these options, which is what you've been working so hard for. And another quick question before, because I really want to hear a story and leave out names, of course, of maybe someone you've worked with and or, or um, someone that's gone through a situation like this. I'd love to hear a um, you know, personal account, but why would someone want to, you know, go out to an investment banker or, or, or someone to run this process for them versus just going to one of these websites that are up yeah. there? Because, I don't know, you go on YouTube, you... I guess the maybe not everyone, but at least the algorithms picked it up for me. It'll just pop up all these ads. Right. I mean, why not just do that? It depends on how big and how important this decision is for you. Right. And that dollar amount that makes it big and important to you is different for everyone. Right. For some person, it might be a hundred thousand. They want to just make sure they get it right. For other people, it might be five million. Right. Um, and so, I would say this market, it's not that old in the grand scheme of things. And um, you can learn a lot by Googling around, by doing research online, um, by having a few conversations. And what I found is most people, after a couple of conversations, they realize, wow, there's a lot to learn. And I'm not sure I want to um, occupy this quarter of my brain with this knowledge set <laughs> because I don't know if it's going to be very valuable for me beyond this month of time that I'm going to spend on it. Um, and two is it does take a lot of time to have these conversations and do your own research. And uh, people would rather oftentimes go and at least, you know, spend a half an hour with me. My, my revenue model is I only charge if I end up uh, helping you find liquidity, right? So, you know, spend a half an hour with me and I'll help you understand the ecosystem. I give a lot of free advice every day. I talk to you know, 1,000, 1,500 shareholders a year. And a portion of those, we end up actually finding liquidity for and working together. Um, but I think well over you know 90% of them leave saying, wow, that was a tremendously useful half hour. And can you tell us, share a story of someone you've worked with before we wrap up? Sure. So. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll share a story of a guy that uh, was really how I, how I came to this business model for Sidecar, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, they were, a, you know, first 30 employee at a company that's now worth four or five billion dollars and um, 60 years old, wanted to retire, um, was sending a child to college, was driving um, Lyft to and from the peninsula to the city every day to just kind of make ends meet and had $5 million in shares. Now it's probably 10. And they came to me and we were talking about, you know, uh, you know, limited recourse solutions at that point in time. And as we got into, um, you know, discussions, uh, you know, 
he used me kind of as a sounding board as he thought about these various solutions, whether it was, you know, limited recourse loans, sale transactions, recourse loans, which was actually off the table for him. And he ultimately ended up deciding to to do a sale transaction, but oftentimes came back and said, hey, maybe I'll do another, you know, limited recourse loan. But I think this is the average person, right? They don't understand the ecosystem. They've got a lot of paper money. They have very little cash and and they need liquidity. And um, you know, the first conversations with this shareholder, they they didn't even know about limited recourse loans and they didn't realize how to really sell shares. And so um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot to be learned, uh, by the average shareholder and it can be done relatively quickly with the right, with the right resources. I'm just amazed, like an early employee of a comp in my mind, I would think that, you know, they'd sit around the water cooler and, and share, you know, Hey guys, you're sitting on this much same here. Yeah. This is why I did this. Or, you know, talk to this guy. Talk. I'm amazed that, uh, it's not a more common conversation for people in that situation. The, it's um, it's becoming less taboo, but the reality is everyone's got a different number of shares, right? Everyone's got, you know, people have different strike prices based on when they came in. People based on their performance might be getting new grants where other folks don't. And so what I find is most shareholders might run this by one or two people that have become their confidants at the company but not much beyond that. They're pretty guarded about it. Um, one, two, there are channels, social media channels, you know, Slack channels, what have you, that many of these alumni of, of unicorn companies will use to share, hey, I spoke with this broker, or I heard the price of the stock is this now, or I talked to this consultant, they're really helpful. Um, and, and so people do other, those are very active communities and that's an informal way for people to, to, um, to share information and, and very helpful to them. Fantastic. Have you ever heard of any horror stories of anyone going through one of these transactions and, and then, uh, you know, we'll wrap it up. Right. Cool. Um, so I was actually, I, I heard about a horror story recently where, you know, Trade was supposed to happen in February of this year, and it's kind of indicative of what's going on in the economy. And the uh, buyer was supposed to transfer funds in February. And as of just recently, which is what, three, four months later, these funds somehow, was, I guess through an SPV or foreign investor, the funds got, um, got hung up in Asia and haven't been released. So like, you know, for some reason, they must have, you know, the funds must have gotten um, noticed, right? Or, you know, yeah. they hit some sort of compliance hiccup and, and it's a material amount of money. It's millions of dollars. And so the seller is just sitting there with market prices coming down, very concerned. Is the buyer actually going to buy these shares? Are they going to deliver on it? Are they going to walk? And um, and it's a, it's a risk uh, that, that you kind of take into your hands when you... Um, when you get into these markets. So I just always can um, implore people to say, look, make sure you have a good counterparty, make sure the buyer has funds, make sure they're communicative with you. If you sense that they're not going to be, really pause and think about, do I, do I have the bandwidth for this? Do I wanna endure what might be frustration for me? Um, if I just am patient, I'll probably find another buyer. And so there's, this is not a commoditized space yet because these are written legal documents. There's real counterparty friction and risk and people should weigh that when they're, when they're deciding who they're going to do business with. Fantastic. And with that, Bryce, if anyone wants to find out more information about you, your company, what's the best way to go about doing it? Sure. You can go to, um, to www.sidecarfinance.com or look me up, Bryce Emo. I'm the only Bryce Emo, B-R-Y-C-E, last name Emo, like the music, E-M-O, on LinkedIn. Reach out. I'm happy to speak with you or your friends or, or companies to help educate them on this space. Fantastic. We'll have all that information in the show notes, including the disclaimer for today's episode. And with that, for everyone out there, if you're looking to 
you know, get your company acquired. You're looking to sell a company. You're looking to raise growth capital. Well, I'm not doing the podcast. I'm an investment banker at a mid-market company. And, um, you know, if you have questions on secondaries, reach out to Bryce here. Uh, I, I learned more in this episode than probably in the last, I can't even think of how many years. But Bryce, I want to thank you once again for being our guest this week on the Silicon Valley podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. 